Connected, Decentralized, and Aggregated, The Future of Capital. Part 1, Coconut Capital. Four years ago, Marico, which is an Indian health and beauty products company, tried a bit of an experiment. They were tired of dealing with middlemen and using them to secure the supply of coconuts that they needed for their potions. So Marico asked tens of thousands of Indian coconut pickers to SMS their mobile numbers to the firm. And now what happens is that every morning, Marico sends those pickers a text with the rate paid that day for coconuts. And if the picker finds that offer attractive, they sell their harvest to Marico. Otherwise, they're free to take their coconuts elsewhere. And through small adjustments in the daily price, Marico can finally modulate the flow of coconuts into its business. This is a textbook example of what you might want to call coconut capitalism. And it's only possible because India's coconut pickers all own mobiles. And there's nothing really unusual about that, actually quite the contrary, because last month we passed a watershed. Over half of the UN race, 3.6 billion people now own their own mobile. And all over the world, the market now travels with the mobile. Wherever you can get a signal from a cell tower, that's where you have a marketplace. You can connect people without respect to space or time. And so the mobile and the market have become two sides of the same coin. East Africa knows this better than any other place on the planet. The explosive growth of Kenya's M-Pesa has fused mobile and market through flows of capital. I mean, a truly astonishing amount of Kenya's payments flows through M-Pesa. A survey from last year put it at 60% of GDP. Now, most of those transactions are peer-to-peer. -peer. They're individuals making payments to individuals and individuals making payments to small businesses and small businesses making payments to other small businesses. And all of that's vital. None of that, however, particularly represents the scale that banking and capitalization need to amplify economic development in East Africa. But some recent fintech innovators are charting a path from mobile money into mobile capital. Fintech startup Stellar.org, which has launched a new digital currency that acts as an intermediary between any currencies and is designed to facilitate transactions in developing economies. They, last week, announced a partnership with South African mobile messaging platform Vumi. Now, Vumi is already powering South Africa's national maternal health care program, MomConnect. That's where new moms in South Africa are sent prenatal health care over the course of their pregnancies via their mobile. The Stellar Vumi partnership allows for the creation of mobile savings accounts. These are banking accounts for the millions of South Africa's unbanked. And it has a particular focus on formal savings accounts for girls. And those savings can be held in cash or they can be held in another popular form, airtime and users can withdraw airtime from their savings accounts as cash. For many in the program, especially amongst girls, that's going to be their first formal savings account. And that transition from mobile money to mobile savings is the first and most necessary step in a disruptive transformation of capital markets. Savings have to be invested in order to reap returns. Today, of course, banks do that for individual account holders. They aggregate the savings into a pool of investment for fractional reserve lending. Another fintech innovator looks set to overturn that model. U.S. firm Lending Club, which did an IPO late last year, made a billion dollars. What they do is they aggregate individuals with capital, with individuals who need that capital. The model is almost deceptively simple. You can be an investor with as little as $25. You can then choose from a set of applicants for loans. You can invest in those applicants who best fit the risk profile of your investment. An applicant provides enough data to make a credit assessment. That information is used to generate an interest rate for the loan, and it's provided to the investors who may be interested in participating in a loan being made to the applicant. And the investor receives returns monthly as the loan is paid back. And all of that happens online. 
It creates a connected peer-to-peer -peer market for capital raising, individuals making loans to other individuals. That model would fit very easily on top of a mobile saving service like the one recently launched by Stellar and Vumi. Vumi already has a connected marketplace of mobile savers. Stellar could easily develop a loan investment product for those mobile savers. Now, this peer-to-peer -peer capitalization might seem like it's a world apart from the huge capitalization requirements of developing economies. And that would have been true a few months ago. But another fintech innovator, Google, has just changed all of that because on the 15th of January, Google announced a partnership with Lending Club to offer business loans of up to U.S. $600,000 to qualified applicants. And just on the basics, that's a good deal for Google because Lending Club is a nice place for Google to pack, park some of the billions of dollars of cash that it has lying around. And the deal has the additional benefit of allowing Google to assist partnered businesses via business loans rather than through direct investment. Google does invest in companies, but Lending Club allows Google to aid businesses that are part of the Google ecosystem but aren't a good fit for their investment portfolio. And Google then gets to accelerate its own growth by accelerating the growth of its partners with business loans, and it ends up earning a tidy profit on the loan too. So that's a win-win. And this, well, that's exactly the kind of a capital market that we're talking about at this conference. The partnership between Lending Club and Google defines a new model for capitalization in a connected economy. And it's one that works equally well for an individual or an SME or a large business. And so as that model proves itself, it's going to be replicated. Companies that aren't as large as Google, but maybe have aspirations, well, they're going to start to build the mechanisms to create business loans that they can make to companies that will accelerate their growth. And so in the immediate future, maybe the next three to five years, those new capitalization mechanisms are going to take root alongside services like M-Pesa and Vumi and Lending Club. And they're going to provide a range of services from microfinance through mortgages all the way up to bond issues. And that disruptive innovation is going to be spearheaded by a range of fintech startups that will take the Lending Club model and clone it and improve it and then compete with it. But that's only the story so far. And it's less than half the story. The next few years will witness yet another technological transition point, one that's going to be as potent and as disruptive as the global adoption of the mobile. By the end of this decade, over 5 billion smartphones will be in the hands of 4 billion people. Those strong and sturdy mobiles that provided the foundation for mobile money, they're, they're going to be replaced by very powerful, very flexible, and very well-connected computers. That transition is already touching markets throughout the world. Part 2, Uber Alles. Fifty years ago this month, IBM shipped the first System 360 mainframes. These are really the first modern computers, and many of those units went directly into service at banks. And when that happened, the accounting ledger book rapidly faded into ob obsolescence. Those electronic ledgers took their place. They did the same job. They did it thousands of times faster and cheaper. And so within a decade, all but the most retrograde financial institutions had digitized their operations. That was something that catapulted the rank, uh, IBM into the ranks of the largest companies in the world. Half a century ago, System 360 disrupted finance. It made the most complex financial transactions within the grasp of almost every institution that could pay IBM for lease. The world of credit, with all of its sophisticated instruments, could not exist before System 360. So think about everything that we use today. No credit cards, no payment processors. None of it would really be a feature of this world. Before System 360, banking and finance in general looked a lot more like 1915 than like 2015. And so that introduction touched off a thorough transformation. Now in September 2014, I purchased a shiny new iPhone 6. 
And what it arrived, I actually ran some calculations, and I realized that this one mobile has about as much power as the entire first year production run of IBM System 360. And in the last quarter of 2014, IBM sold iPhone 6s to 1% of the human race. And in another two years, they're going to be at the bottom of the product range. There are going to be hundreds of millions of them out there. Each one is going to be capable of running not just a single organization, but it's going to be able to run an entire financial network. And it's right here in the palm of your hand, but repeated hundreds of millions of times over. And that simple and inevitable fact takes everything that has already happened with mobile money and turns it inside out. M-Pesa and every other mobile money system that's out there relies on a carrier and a bank to mediate exchanges of value. But a digital currency, whether that's Stellar or Bitcoin or who knows what, they allow individuals to exchange stores of value without an intermediary, allows them to do it nationally or internationally. And already, Bitcoin is becoming the de facto standard for remittances in countries like the Philippines because it operates more quickly, it incurs much lower fees. I don't know if you saw, but in the news it was reported on Monday that the nation of Ecuador has announced the introduction of its own state-backed digital currency. It's going to be using that alongside its de facto currency, which is the US dollar. And Ecuador is going to aggressively promote this digital currency as a frictionless payment system that can be used across the entire country. Now, smartphones are ideal carriers for digital currencies because they can support the kinds of cryptographic features that are required to secure a digital currency. Where the mobile went, mobile money soon followed. And where the smartphone goes, digital currencies will follow. The mobile put the market in the hand of individuals. The smartphone allows individuals to quickly and efficiently create new markets. Uber, a well-known disruptive tech startup, aggregates drivers. It connects them with a pool of individuals looking for rides. And it does this with little more than a smartphone app. Uber has created a virtual $40 billion global transportation provider requiring almost none of the capitalization that would normally act as a barrier to market entry. And Uber is really only the first and the most obvious example of this appification of the economy. It is very reasonable to imagine that Indian for America might launch a smartphone app that would connect directly to the coconut pickers and it would create a commodity trading platform for coconuts. We could imagine that the coconut pickers might make an app for themselves that instantly aggregates them into a collective with substantial market power and which gives any member of the collective the collective capacity to negotiate with any buyer anywhere at any time. And now, imagine that this is happening in every other possible market. Markets that exist today and markets that will exist tomorrow because of the power of the smartphone to remove the frictions that have always prevented market formation. A few years ago, Mark Andreessen, who created Mozilla, which is basically the first web browser, he stated confidently that software is eating the world. And we can add a corollary to that. Connectivity is eating markets. Those markets don't stop with physical items like coconuts or services like transportation. Every market will be transformed, including the capital markets. And so within a decade, the global banking system and capital markets will be shaped by 4 billion people with 5 billion smartphones. And each of them are going to be using a range of currencies, state currencies and digital currencies, to support market activities. That world is simultaneously decentralized because banks will be increasingly disintermediated by smartphones and re-centralized because the appification of markets creates rapid and fleeting aggregations of labor and resources and capital. So how do we leapfrog the 20th century mechanisms for capital raising? I mean, that's the question that's confronting us as we discuss how to bring capital markets into East Africa. And so just as M-Pesa leapfrogged the 20th century payment systems and thrust Kenya into an economy that basically no one predicted, 
there's an opportunity to create a new platform for capital that leverages the combination of connectivity, decentralization, and aggregation to amplify the capacity of individuals and organizations to create capital markets. Lending Club and Google are already most of the way toward a definition of a new kind of capital market. I want you to study what they've done, replicate the best bits. Picasso once said that good artists copy, but great artists steal. Now, big banks find it difficult to stomach activities that disrupt their markets. They can innovate around the edges, but transformative innovation will almost always come from small fintech startups with nothing to lose. Startups disrupt because that's how they create a place in the market for themselves. They live fast, they burn bright, most of them crash. But the ones that survive, the ones that thrive, transform banking and capital. Can you identify these companies? Can you trust them to lead the way into the appification of the economy? And can you embrace a disruption of the way that you do business today? Cast yourself back to those bankers in early 1965. They had no idea what was coming. And we are roughly in the same position, except this time we have a precedent to learn from. We know that everywhere the smartphone goes, capital markets will be transformed. Now, we might not know the precise shape of the future of capital, but we know that it's connected, decentralized, and aggregated. And if we can lean into these three trends, then the billions that are already connected in these everywhere always on markets, they're going to do much of the work for us. And those billions, connected now with mobiles and soon to be connected by incredibly powerful smartphones, they are the engines of these new capital markets. Harness their intelligence, harness their capacity, and capital will follow. Thank you.